You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's up? How you doing? I hope all is well and thanks for listening to my show Straight to Video. Today it's an absolute pleasure to bring you a chat with Catherine Mary Stewart who starred in a couple of my all-time favourite films growing up and two films that I consider definitively 80s, The Last Starfighter and Night of the Comet from 1984. Both of these had such an impact on me in their look and storytelling, which I still love watching to this day. And even for my 40th birthday a few years ago, I did a mock-up poster of myself as The Last Starfighter's Alex Rogan. Some of you will also know Catherine from her role in Weekend at Bernie's, and she's constantly stayed busy in the industry with several new projects set for release, such as The Elevator Game with Fright Night's William Ragsdale, the new film Ask Me to Dance, as well as being a regular on the convention circuit with her Last Starfighter and Night of the Comet Coast stars. Catherine has lots of great stories and we cover a lot of stuff in this conversation from her time living and studying in London, her first film role, moving to LA and of course the impact and legacy of The Last Starfighter and Night of the Comet. If you've not seen either of these films, please do your best to check them out as I'd love to hear what you think. You can find Catherine on social media through Facebook or Instagram at simply Catherine Mary Stewart. But right now, please enjoy my straight to video talk with Catherine Mary Stewart. Cool. How are you? I'm doing well. How are you? Yeah, pretty good. Pretty good. Lovely to see you. So where are you right now? You are in New York on the East Coast. I'm in New York. I'm in New York. Yeah. Whereabouts? Are you like in the Manhattan area? So I'm downtown. I'm in Battery Park City, it's called. So it's like Chambers and the West Side Highway. So yeah, we've been living here for this apartment for about five years. Sort of been in transition over the last 10 or 12 years because the kids graduated from high school and went to college. And so we kept whittling down. So we've got now a two bedroom as opposed to a four bedroom. And but yeah, it's been a very busy year traveling to Italy for three weeks with my husband to celebrate our 30th wedding anniversary. Oh, awesome. Yeah, that was really fun. But it was like also exhausting, but it was it was wonderful. I've been doing like conventions and things and just got back from Canada. We were spreading my dad and my mom's ashes. My dad passed away in 2020. My mom in 2017. So we did this whole trek to Saskatchewan because I'm from Canada originally. And my dad was born and raised in Saskatchewan. And he had asked my brother, I guess it was sort of a casual thing. You know, my dad was a marine biologist, but he'd done lots of work in rivers and lakes in Canada. And he said, if you guys want to, you know, you can spread my ashes. It's called the Saskatchewan River Forks. And in Canada, the North North Saskatchewan River, which is a big river, and the South Saskatchewan River, which is also a big river, meet at, in northern Saskatchewan, where I grew up in Edmonton. It was right on the North Saskatchewan. So it meets in this incredible, beautiful area in northern Saskatchewan, but it's very remote. <laughs> it was quite a trek to get there, but it was beautiful. And we tossed some ashes in there at the Forks. And, you know, we had a little celebration. We said some words and things like that. So that was beautiful. Who went there? Was it just you and your brothers or was there a whole family gathering? Yes, it was all the extended family as well. I mean, my husband, my kids, my brother, his partner and his daughter, my other brother and his two kids. So it was a big reunion, really, which was lovely because we haven't done that for a long time. I'm in the States, you know, I'm in New York. One brother's in Edmonton, one is in Vancouver. So, you know, we don't get a chance to all get together very often. Out to something kind of so sad, it's nice that it brought you all back together and you got to do that. I know. It, it really was. It was really lovely. And then we traveled to this place where my great grandfather homesteaded in southern Saskatchewan. But what's cool about that is that there's still an outline of his home. He immigrated from England, like in his 50s, and they were selling like quarter lots, which are 160 acres for $10. So he packed up from Nottingham and moved to Saskatchewan. And oh my gosh, it was, I'm sure it was a rude awakening, put it that way, because it is like flat 
desert, basically. You mentioned Nottingham. That's literally a stone's throw away from where I am. No, maybe we're related. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm like 10 miles outside of Nottingham. And I read that. I wondered if it was like an internet riddle and it perhaps wasn't true. But that's cool that that's where your grandfather's actually from. Yeah, great grandfather. Yeah, yes, and my grandfather. Isn't that wild? What did they do in the UK? Did you ever find out? Oh boy, I should know this probably. My brothers are really good at all this stuff. I know that once they got to Saskatchewan, so it was Henry and Hannah Nursall. And in Saskatchewan, apparently she was a midwife for a few people in the area. And he was just a farmer, you know, just trying to survive, I reckon. But in Nottingham, I'm not, I can't remember off the top of my head. Have you ever visited Nottingham? You ever trace it anything back there? I have. Yeah. Wow. Yes, back in it must have been like 1979 or something like that. I spent a couple of years in London. I went to a performing arts school called the London Studio Centre back in 78, 79, and my parents were actually over there. My dad was on sabbatical and he was doing some work, and we did a little road trip and we went through Nottingham and visited some uh, relatives on that trip. I think we made it all the way up to Edinburgh, actually, because my mother, her roots are in Edinburgh. Wow. You covered some miles then. Yeah, yeah. We we covered some ground. Yes, for sure. My dad was really into keeping all our connections going all the time. Very cool. So what was the town like you grew up before moving away? Because I say before you came to London, is there anything you look back fondly on in your hometown, places you would go or anything like that? Sure. I mean, I lived there until I was 18. So I actually still, it's so interesting with things like Facebook, social media in general, how you can reconnect with friends from decades ago that 20 years ago was impossible. I mean, it's changed an awful lot since I've been there, obviously, because I haven't lived there since I moved to London. But of course, it was my childhood home. There's sad things. I mean, like the house that I grew up in was torn down and the property, they stuck two smaller houses up on it, which I, you know, it's like, so things slowly are changing. But for instance, last time I was there, I went for dinner with my best friend from grade one, you know? Wow. (laughs) (laughs) Because we'd reconnected on Facebook and it was just like, whoa, this is so bizarre. That was fun. Yeah, I mean, we had a really nice childhood upbringing. Like I said, we lived near the River Valley, which was the North Saskatchewan River, which was a big, beautiful river. I do remember very cold winters, very long winters, very sort of mucky springs because there was a lot of snow and then a lot of mosquitoes. Back when I was growing up, they used to spray. Planes would go over the city and spray like DDT or whatever it was. (laughs) And they don't do that anymore. But it was interesting back in the day, it'd be like, okay, today we're going to be spraying, so stay indoors. We had no concept of, oh, you know, they're poisoning us. (laughs) You ask me what animal on the planet Earth I hate the most, it's a mosquito. Right, fair enough. So what was the contrast to coming to London then when you was like in your late teens? I mean, was that your first time outside of Canada? We were very lucky the way we were brought up. I mean, my dad, being a professor at the University of Alberta, so every seven years or something like that, you could take a sabbatical, so a research leave. And the first time I was in London was the first sabbatical, I was like, three years old, we spent a year in in London. So I was very young. And of course, I don't really remember it, but we have lots of photos and things like that. Both my brothers went to school when we were there. So that was my first experience in London. And when I graduated from high school, I had been training in Canada, in Edmonton as a dancer. I was in a company, we did lots of traveling and performing. And I decided that's what I wanted to do was to pursue dance. So I was trying to think where I would go. I wanted to get out of Edmonton. So I sort of narrowed my options down to Toronto, and New York, or London. And I chose London more because I just sort of had an affinity to it somehow. There was a a familiarity with London. So I took that leap of faith, jumping into, you know, this whole different culture and and kind of like taking classes. I mean, I'd always sort of rotated around this comfort zone where when I started dance, I stayed in the same school, we created this company, we did all this stuff. I never had to really audition and 
it was comfortable. So when I moved to London, it was like, gee, am I good enough for this? You know? So it was nerve wracking at first, but then it was a wonderful, wonderful experience for me. And it got me my first job. What was there outside of classes? Did, is there anything you used to enjoy? Did you go and see shows while you're out in London? Occasionally, yes. But, you know, classes were pretty intense. It was an all day thing. And it was not only dance, it was every kind of dance, but it was also acting and singing. And it was a general performing arts focusing on dance school. So it gave me a, a wonderful foundation, that's for sure. I mean, I had done acting in high school and things like that, but this was a great way for me to create a foundation that I was able to take advantage of when I got my first job, which was in London. Yeah. Is this in the 1980, the science fiction musical, The Apple? Because didn't you originally just go for the role as a dancer, but landed the lead role? Right. Exactly. That was so bizarre. When I went to London, my teacher mentor in Edmonton said, you know, just take advantage of auditions if they come up, you know, just really put yourself out there and experience things. And I was literally walking to class and I saw a couple of my classmates from dance class walking away from where class was. So I stopped them and I asked them where they were going. They said, well, we heard about this audition. So we thought we'd just try out. Why not? So I tagged along with them. I had no idea. I wasn't prepared. I, you know, you were supposed to come prepared with all sorts of stuff. And I just kind of showed up. It was an open audition. So I was able to do that. And it was a very new experience for me. It was just like a cattle call audition, meaning there was probably 200 people there. And the director saw me and pulled me out of this crowd and asked me if I could act. And it was also a musical. So he asked me if I could sing. It was a futuristic rock musical. I was like, sure, I can do all that junk, I guess. They had me read and sing and dance and all that stuff. And I ended up scoring the lead role in this thing. Did your friends get any roles in it who was going for the audition? Ooh, I don't even think they were even cast as dancers. But oh, wow. you know, they were <laughs> young. And a lot of the dancers were professional dancers. They'd been doing it for a long time. And they were just young students just trying this thing. But yeah, it was a bizarre situation, but hey, you got to take advantage when the opportunity comes along, right? Definitely. Was it actually shot in London or around the UK or did it go on location elsewhere? We shot primarily in Berlin, Germany, and this was before the wall was down. So we all shipped off to Berlin. We had to fly through East Germany and all this other stuff. There was a lot of security going through all this. Ended up in West Berlin, which was fascinating in itself because on one day off, I went to East Berlin with Joss Ackland, you know, the actor Joss Ackland. From the West, you could go East, but from the East, you couldn't go West, which was kind of indicative of a system that's probably not working great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, we have to imprison you, but this is a great system. So that was fascinating because West Berlin was like a circus. It was more extreme than, say, New York or something. It felt like because people were sort of living in this little island, which it was because it was surrounded by East Germany, it's almost like it gave people the freedom for extremes. And so there was a really very active nightlife. Lots and lots of that. I was very young and I really didn't do a lot of stuff, but I tagged along every once in a while. It's like, well, okay, wow, this is different <laughs> <laughs> for me. But I mean, we had so much fun. We had a great time. I mean, it's pretty epic looking set pieces and stuff. I mean, this was around the time of films like Xanadu, The Wiz, Greece, all in that three or four year area for a film like that. But it's like a science fiction musical set in 1994, which sounds bizarre now, like where we are now in 2022. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It was not necessarily science fiction, but more futuristic. Right. Yeah. And so it was supposed to be life on Earth in the future, which in 1979 was 1994. So they were taking some liberty. I mean, it was funny that it was like 
I mean, that's not that far in the future, guys. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's not going to be that many changes. It's always a joke. I mean, the movie is is a strange movie at the best of times. But, you know, it's so funny, the choices that they made in terms of costumes. And, oh, it was like when we started out, the makeup and the hair especially were very elaborate. So they kind of shot the end in the beginning because... And the only reason I remember this is because the hair and makeup was so elaborate. I mean, it took hours and hours and hours to do hair and makeup, especially when there was a lot of extras and everything. So they just kept making the makeup and hair much simpler because they had to get people out on the set. They couldn't have people come in at three in the morning. And so anyway, it's pretty funny. But yeah, it's a weird, crazy movie. (laughs) Was it Nigel Lithgow who did all the choreography and the dancing and stuff like that? He did. I'm not sure that he aggressively admits that. But <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> because he certainly uh, made a name for himself as well. But yeah, no, he was the choreographer. And a lot of the dancers that ended up working on the show had worked with him before. Yeah, he was fantastic. I mean, again, very 80s, very of that genre. But I mean... Golan Globus, the production company, they ended up forming Canon Films. They went into this thing thinking that it was going to be their big intro into the American film market. They put their heart and soul into this. They were banking on this thing to be super successful. And when it kind of flopped, it was devastating for them. But they found their niche in the American film market. But they were huge in Israel. That was, that's where they came from. And they were very big and highly respected in Israel, but their goal was to go to Hollywood and this was going to be their ticket. So it was tough when that didn't happen the way they wanted it to happen, but they figured it out, you know, and I certainly don't regret doing it. It's kind of a laugh and it has this insane cult following. I would imagine. Yeah. It's been screened at Lincoln Center here, which is a highly respectable theater center in New York. It's been screened there like three times. And there was a period where, and I think, maybe still they were doing like midnight screenings like a la rocky horror picture show where people were like dressing up in costumes and repeating the words my husband and i years ago i was just like nesting in new york we moved to new york and i had a couple of babies and i was like my opportunities kind of fell away because i'd left la and all this other stuff and one day this guy from entertainment magazine or something he called somehow got my number called me and said you know, you do know the Apple is this huge cult hit. And I'm like, cult? Oh? <laughs> <laughs> this is like, I don't know, in the 90s, right? In 90s, a five or six or something like that. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And I found out that it was playing in some small theater in New York. So my husband and I went to see what was going on. And it was just wild. It was so bizarre. The film perhaps wasn't a success, but did you see it as an opportunity to have TV and cinema as a career? Did things start making sense to you? Like, oh, I see a path here, move back to America. And I think you eventually went to Los Angeles in the early 80s. Did it like open doors for you? I did. Well, It absolutely opened doors to me. And it's funny because I didn't plan anything. I didn't, you know, in my mind, it was like, okay, let's see what happens with this. And actually what brought me to LA was Menachem, the director. He invited me to come to be in another one of his movies. Ultimately, it didn't work out, but it was the impetus to move to LA and just to see what would happen. I mean, I really had no kind of In my mind, I was a dancer and I was like, you know, this is kind of cool. This is fun. This is really interesting. Let's see where this goes. And if it doesn't go anywhere, I can go back to dance. Where does that headspace come from? Like, oh, let's just give it a shot. Is that from your parents or your brothers or where does that come from? I was going to say, I think I was just young and naive. (laughs) And I think absolutely my parents instilled in me this idea of taking chances and going for things and really putting yourself out there. I mean, they created a feeling of something like fearlessness. I mean, obviously, when you try something new, it's always like very scary, but they were very encouraging when my brothers and I left home to really spread our wings and experience the world and life and embrace it. So there was always, I think, that attitude. You know, it was subconscious, but I wasn't driven to be a movie star. And I also wasn't willing to do 
anything to be a movie star right. or something like that, which that is kind of a scary drive behind a lot of young actors is they will do whatever it takes to get some notoriety or whatever. And I think that can work sometimes, but it can also backfire big time. People can take advantage of you when they see like you're so desperate in that. You are on the other end, you've got the fearlessness, but also the confidence say, no, I'm not interested in that. It shows you've got a confidence, maybe a cockiness as well, perhaps. A little bit. I don't know. I, I just didn't buy into the culture. I didn't really turn things down, but I just wasn't willing to. I mean, if I was cast in something, well, obviously, if I liked it, then I would do it. But I mean, one of the first pieces of advice that I got when I arrived in L.A. was in order to be successful in this business, you have to compromise yourself sleep around, do whatever it is. Casting couch is alive and well. And I literally sat there listening to this person who was a powerful manager. We were talking about him representing me. And I was like, first of all, you're not going to represent me. And second, if that's what it takes, I am not interested in doing this. That's not something that I'm interested in doing. It's not worth it to me. So I was lucky in that I didn't have to, to accomplish what I accomplished, but it was really jarring. And, and, you know, the reckoning is happening, you know, the whole Me Too thing and all that other stuff. But it's a part of the culture that I hope with all this insight that we're all getting about what we already knew was happening anyway, but at least it's out in the open. Hopefully it will change the culture because it's very toxic. It can be very, very toxic. Now it's all out in the open. People can have that almost like your foresight, like, no, I'm not interested in that. That's not the route I'm going to take to get those roles. It's out there now, which is great. It is great. How did you personally find LA and Los Angeles in the early 80s? How was it for you arriving there? I loved it. Yeah. (laughs) I loved it. Oh, my God. You know, coming from Canada and Edmonton, where, like I was saying earlier, you know, winters are eight months long. It's ridiculous. It gets so cold to moving to a place where some people complain that there's no weather because it's always the same, you know. LA is always like 80 degrees, which is whatever centigrade. And I was just like, this is the best thing ever. (laughs) This is never going to get old. I loved it. Plus, I really fell into a sweet spot in terms of the movie industry. They were making lots of fun films for people my age. Right. Life could not have been better. I liked everything about the 80s. <laughs> I liked the fashion. I liked just everything. I loved the hair, you know, the big hair, the big shoulders. I always joke because I had this like dancer's body, which is basically, I grew up very, very skinny, basically a little boy's body. <laughs> And so for me to have sort of these accentuated shoulders and the the belts was kind of cinched you in, I felt like finally I had some shape, you know, in my body and I had this big hairdo and oh, it was so much fun. It was just a really wonderful time in LA. What was your first apartment like though? Uh, Well, when I first got there and I was unemployed, yeah, I had an apartment, like a studio apartment, which means it's one big room, right? Except for the bathroom. I had the studio apartment off of Vineland in Studio City, Vineland and Ventura Boulevard. And now it's a cool residential place. There's great stores nearby and blah, blah, blah. But at that time, I would look out my back window and and you would see like ladies of the evening <laughs> doing their business. And you wouldn't go outside necessarily on Ventura Boulevard at night. But I didn't care. Oh, my God. I loved it. I remember my first earthquake and I thought it was the coolest thing ever. I mean, I literally felt the building shake. And I went out and I swear I saw the earth go like this, sort of away from me. And I was like, wow. <laughs> but it didn't like scare me per se and it shakes people up so to speak you landed a role in days of our lives which is like an iconic and legendary soap opera in the u.s was it the role of kayla brady you played which is it a character that's still in the storyline it is i was the original though i was the original the brady family became a very important family in the days of our lives storyline. I was only on for a couple of years. I had a couple of brothers, Roman and Bo. And when I left, they didn't replace Kayla right away. It was a, I don't know how long, but they ended up replacing her and she was very, very popular. But my claim to fame is that I was the original. Was it whilst on Days of Our Lives you got the opportunity for The Last Starfighter? 
Was that during that time? It was. I was still auditioning when I was on Days of Our Lives for other things, which was good because as I was sort of being written off Days of Our Lives, I got The Last Starfighter. So it was a very easy transition for me. I was very, very lucky. I mean, that's a film which will always be ingrained in my heart. I love the film, but one thing that I remember is my uncle got a copy of it one Christmas. It must have been Christmas 1985. I'm trying to think of the timeline. Obviously, the film came out in 84, but for him to get a copy on video, it must have been the Christmas of 85. He says, I've got three films for you. I've got Gremlins, Ghostbusters and Last Starfighter. We're going to watch them all over Christmas. So that's like a trio of perfect films, all from the summer of 1984. I mean, what a summer of films. It's unbelievable. I know. That's what I'm saying. I mean, the 80s for these kind of films was so terrific. Yeah. It was ripe, you know, and, and they're just fun and exciting. And But they're also like Flash Starfighters kind of inspiring yes. for a lot of people. You know, if you grab on with both hands, like your dream kind of shows up and you don't know if you're able to handle it or not, but you just got to go for it. If you don't try, you'll never know. It's so fun to be a part of that movie because it had so much staying power and people that embraced it when they were young still are passionate about it to this day. For me, it's not even the scenes in outer space that it own. It is more the trailer park scenes which really resonate. And it's a wonderful group of people as well from young to old and everyone works so well together. Was it like that on set? Oh, it was wonderful on set. It was such a lovely work environment. Yeah. It was a small film, but it was a lot of younger people putting it together. And it was a, you know, a passion project for them. It was really from the heart. And you felt that every day working when you really felt sort of the integrity and the the joy of movie making. And I think that comes across, you know, I think it comes across. And, you know, Lance and I weren't like unknown, which was sort of unusual to cast sort of unknowns for this kind of a thing. But that also added to the charm of the thing. And there were no egos involved. You know, Robert Preston, who was like a massive movie star, I mean, he was iconic. I didn't actually get to work with him, sadly. I did meet him, but I didn't get to work with him. But Lance guest who played Alex, he said he was so gracious with him because Lance just wanted to you know he was a young actor and he wanted to do the best he could and he wanted to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse and Robert Preston was like whatever you want I'll do it and you know he was not a young man at that time so that was very very cool there's reasons why some of these iconic actors had such long careers because of the way they worked and able to get along with people absolutely the director Nick Castle I guess he had an integral part of getting you all to work so well is it the same nick castle who played michael myers in halloween yes it is yes it is was that ever discussed at any point no (laughs) uh, i didn't know it cracks me up because we have done conventions together for me of course it's the last starfighter and i also night of the comet is fairly popular with these things but lance was in a jaws and he was in a halloween i think but nick castle who is the original mike myers i mean it's just unbelievable how popular he is And he didn't really want to do these convention things. But oh my God, he just has so many fans. And I joke with him. I'm like, we're sitting there, Lance and I, we've got this lineup of people that want to meet him and stuff like that. Lance and I are sitting there going, honestly, you know, shift them over here when you're done. (laughs) If they know what The Last Starfighter is, I would go up to Nick and I'd say, that could be anybody. You were wearing a mask. It could have been anybody. And it was like, when they shot that movie, I don't know, I think it was like a PA or something like that. And it was like, throw this mask on and be this character. You know, it wasn't like he wasn't cast in it. Yeah. You know, officially or anything like that. He just, (laughs) so I mean, but he is reaping the benefits, man, because people love the idea of the first Michael Myers and uh, (laughs) it makes me laugh because he's laughing at the same time. He's just like, I don't know. I, whatever. First ever Kayla Brady over here. Exactly. (laughs) Hello. Hello. (laughs) Yeah, the horror, you know, the horror genre and fans are a whole, whole different group. You know, they are passionate about their guys. Do you remember the first time you saw The Last Starfighter? Was there a premiere of it or anything like that? I don't have a specific memory of it, I have to say. 
I'm sure there was a premiere. I do remember seeing it. It must have been at the premiere. It must have been. And feeling like I was able to watch it without watching myself too much. I could separate myself from watching the movie, which was huge because as an actor, for me, and everybody's different. Some people insist on watching every take, you know, doing all that. I'm more like, I have to trust in the director to direct me and trust that whatever take he settles on is what he wants. I don't want to be sitting there self-analyzing because I don't really feel like I should be the one to judge the performance. It's the director's job. You know what I mean? And it's always skewed because like when you hear your voice on a recording for the first time, you're like, oh my God, what? That's not me or anything. See yourself on screen for the first time. You just have this sort of skewed idea. And so what was nice for me with The Last Starfighter was that I could watch the movie and be entertained by the movie itself and not just get caught up with my performance. When did you first show it your children? What did they think of it? Well, I think the first time they saw it was... They're born three years apart, but like July 27th and July 29th. So they one year, I forget exactly how old they were. They were probably like seven and 10 or something like that. They both wanted to have sleepover parties. So we agreed to that. And they wanted to show, we had quite a big television in our, in this big room. They wanted to have like sleeping bags all over the floor and watch Night of the Comet and The Last Starfighter. That's a double bill right there. (laughs) So it was their idea. That's a double bill. I was kind of blown away by that. I thought that was super sweet. And it was really fun to kind of spy on all the kids and see what their reaction was and everything. But yeah, I don't think they've seen it since. I mean, you know, being an actor and a mom, the mom part is incredible incredibly humbling because as an actor you know you get all these like oh people think you're so great and blah 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 and everybody's oh you're so super and kids are like yeah no your mom <laughs> period and all this attention is really boring and it's embarrassing just don't even go there with us so it's very humbling <laughs> but it's good i mean because it keeps your priorities straight right yeah definitely There's long been talk of a remake or a reboot of Last Starfighter, but I believe a sequel is a genuine possibility too, right? So Jonathan Betchwell, who is the writer, has come up with a sequel. And he's basically, he owns the rights to The Last Starfighter, which was, I believe it was Universal had the rights, but the Writers Guild, there was some relatively new rule that after 30 years, if the original writer wants them back, he can have them back. And so Jonathan Betchwell has the rights. And has written a script that's a sequel that would involve Lance Guest and myself and like the next generation. So it would maintain that grounding on Earth. And then I guess, I mean, I don't really know what the story is. I'm not going to divulge any secrets or anything like that. But there would be that that grounding, which is to me very, very important. So you would be definitely up for the sequel for Last Starfighter then, should it happen? Oh, yeah. Oh, for sure. Absolutely. I would love it. Especially based on the people that are involved with it. Maintain the integrity of the story and have, you know, the foundation be about the people, not the violence and the special effects and all that. Because I think that's what makes a movie work. Straight off the back of Last Starfighter, you'd land the role of Reggie in Night of the Comet. Again, another film I have such fond memories of. The whole look of that film is so iconic, especially like the deserted scenes of LA. Do you recall how tricky it was to do that? Did they have to get permits to shoot at that time or was it guerrilla filmmaking? That's what I call it. I call it that, guerrilla filmmaking. Well, I'm sure they had to get permits, yes. I don't think you're allowed to shoot just randomly in Los Angeles. But the, what was so great about it, I mean, there were really, there was no special effects. You know, Last Starfighter was the very first movie really done with CGI to that extent. They were literally creating, they created programs for that movie. But in Night of the Comet, that was a whole other thing. The budget was under a million dollars. To create the red sky, it was literally a lens on the camera. It wasn't any special effect at all. The fact that we could shoot in downtown LA and nobody was around was the fact that nobody was around back in those days. It's now very residential. I mean, it's a hip place to live now, you know, the apartments in downtown LA. So there's a lot of traffic. Back then, it was mostly, you know, 
banks and business people coming into town for meetings or whatever. But we shot somewhere around Christmas, like Christmas morning, first thing in the morning or something like that. And there was nobody there. So all those scenes, we didn't have this army of cops holding back traffic or anything like that. It was deserted. That's kind of a cool thing about Night of the Comet. You can never do that again, unless, of course, you had $40 million to like shut down downtown LA. Again, I feel like I've landed in so many sweet spots in my career, you know, (laughs) especially in the early years. I just feel so lucky. But it's always in retrospect, you know, when you're shooting these things, you don't really think about all this stuff. You just kind of do it. I mean, we had bare minimum in terms of everything, like makeup and hair and trailers. And it was just the bare essentials always. But that is also something that kind of adds to the charm of it in a way. You know, we didn't depend on all sorts of stuff. We just told this quirky, funny, kind of scary at times, weirdo movie that Tom Everhart came up with because he's just an incredibly imaginative, wonderful guy that we, you know, Kelly and I happened to uh, be a part of. We got to work with the late Jeffrey Lewis in Night of the Comet. What an incredible actor. I love it every time he appears on the scene in any film. Me too. He is, again, he's just... I loved him. He's such a wonderful, giving actor. I loved him. I just, I loved his face. And he has these eyes that are just these blue, crystal blue eyes. I adored him. I thought he was so sweet and so nice and such a good actor, you know, such a great character actor. He's like a comfort blanket when he appears on screen. If he pops up in a film, it's like, oh, this is going to be a good film. (laughs) Exactly. So we were so lucky to have him. We had a great cast you know it was a terrific cast in general so all the elements just sort of came together and again like I was saying you know you don't think of these things at the time but in retrospect you sort of think wow I was really lucky to be a part of that you know Mary Warrenov, Robert Beltran, Jeffrey Lewis the cast was wonderful it was Ivan E. Roth was the guy in the basement of the department store he's so funny We reconnected at a screening of Night of the Comet in L.A. a couple of years ago. Just the nicest guy. Hadn't seen him since Night of the Comet. He'd done a few other things and then he sort of went off in this other path. But we also did a convention together a few weeks ago. And he's so funny because we did a QA. and a And at these Q&As, you learn so much from the other actors. He was saying that because this zombie thing was progressing in the script, he was supposed to have like this voice thing because the moisture is leaving. But apparently they couldn't hear what he was saying. So he created this whole character. Hello, shoppers. You know that? That whole thing that he does. That was all him. He created that character and it's iconic. You know, it's like some of his lines are a little, um, I don't know, a little uh, shady or whatever, a little whatever, but he had a lot to do with how that character unfolded, which is so much fun to hear about because I, you know, I, I didn't know. So you do those two films, Last Starfighter and Night of the Comet, but how was it to be transported back in time to the 1950s on the set of Mischief, which came out the following year, 85? Was that a fun time? Because it always blows my mind how sets and props like that all come together with so much attention to detail. I always think it's incredible that they can recreate whole towns and even stuff in the far distance, which isn't even close in shot. It's all there. So how was that for you? Could you like really immerse yourself in it being on that set? Again, so much fun. I feel like mischief slipped into the cracks. You know, it, I think it's a terrific movie and people will comment on it. It's one of their favorite movies. And I think it's very authentically 50s as well. I mean, there's no kind of beating around the bush in terms of wardrobe and hair and makeup. And the sets we shot in this little town called Nelsonville, Ohio, where that's where the square was, kind of this little forgotten town. And we came in and dressed it all up and made it look authentically 50s. You know, we shot a lot of stuff in rural Ohio. So you can shoot film of fields that go on and on and on forever. You can really go back back in time in places like that. So it was super fun. Again, wonderful cast. 
all these young kids, I think I was the oldest, actually, we had so much fun. There were so many in-jokes going on. Doug McKeon and Kelly Preston, they had this little competition thing going on. It was it had something to do with a stuffed animal. It would show up in like their dressing room, like hanging from a rope or something. And then I know one time we came back to our hotel room and one of the cast had taken the possessions of another cast mate, wrapped them up in a sheet and hung them out their hotel window. And I remember driving up to the hotel, seeing this thing hanging out the window, going, what the heck? But it was all so much fun. I mean, we weren't violent or we didn't destroy things. It was just a bunch of kids having a great time. I'm still in touch with Doug McKeon and Chris Nash. And of course, Kelly Preston, who was, I don't think I've heard anybody ever say anything bad about this person. And rightfully so. She was just a lovely, lovely human being physically and just her whole body and soul was, she was lovely. She's a lovely person. So that, that was very, we were all very sad when we heard of her passing away. So, but we all got along great and we are still in touch. Maybe that's another sign of, you know, a successful movie is when you stay in touch with the cast. I'm in touch with Lance. I'm in touch with Kelly. I'm in touch with all these people and, and the directors as well. It's, uh, it's fun. We mentioned earlier about the cult status of some of your films. There were successful films initially. I mean, I think Night of the Comet, compared to the budget and how much it took at the box office, it was a very successful film in that aspect. But they just kind of grow once they go on to VHS as well. Right. Again, hit a sweet spot, right? Right. Yeah, definitely. But they grow for generations as well later on through videotapes and stuff. And then it takes the next step into conventions. So when do you recall by being introduced into conventions and seeing the impact of the films over the years? Yeah, that was a bizarre thing. I mean, I went to the, I think it was the 25th anniversary of The Last Starfighter in Los Angeles and Santa Monica. That's where I learned we did the Q&A with all the technical people. That's what I learned the significance of the CGI. I didn't know anything about any of this stuff. But when I came out of that, there was somebody who says, I represent people who do conventions and I'm really interested in representing you. First of all, you know, I was thinking of Star Trek conventions and they kind of get a bad rap or it's not, they're not taken seriously or whatever. And I was like, oh, I don't know. Oh, I don't know that I want to, I don't know what that means, what conventions mean. I, I don't know if I want to do it. Eventually, he talked me into it. And the first one I did was in New Jersey. But I think it was around 2011, I want to say. First of all, I got to meet Davy Jones of the Monkees, which was very good (laughs) because I had a crush on him when I was a kid. And actually, this was a convention that was not just strictly science fiction. It really had an enormous number of really cool actors that I kind of got to meet. But also just I was blown away by the attention that I got because of The Last Starfighter. And Lance was with me, too, in that one. So, yeah, it's wild. You know, you kind of get used to it, I guess. But you don't get used to the enthusiasm and the stories that you hear about, you know, how they found the movie and the influence that it had and how they're like trying to pass it down to you know their kids and things like that it's wild I feel grateful is what I feel I just feel grateful to have been a part of these just lovely movies that I'm very very proud of and that have this sort of sustainability you know that seems to be going on well obviously decades and hopefully generations it's a magical thing really I say it's it's testament to the films that came out during that time Thanks ever so much for chatting with me, Catherine. I've loved hearing the stories and stuff. Oh, I I appreciate you um, being patient with me and my schedule because I kept giving you dates and they got later and later. And then even today, I was like, we put it off an hour. So I appreciate you accommodating me the way you have. You're very kind. All good. Well, hopefully see you next time you come into the UK, but um, you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks so much. Have a good evening.
Thanks so much to Catherine Mary Stewart for taking the time to chat with me here on the Strict Video Podcast. Hope you enjoyed hearing all about her journey. And if you're not familiar with her films, please dive back and check them out as there's some real gold and just outright great storytelling in them, which I know you'll enjoy. If you're looking for something fun to do over the weekends and you're in and around the Midlands area, then please consider swinging by the Strict Video 80s Video Shop in Alfreton, Derbyshire. We're just 10 minutes from Junction 28 of the M1 and we've recreated an authentic video shop experience for you to turn back the clocks and relive visiting a video shop in the 80s and early 90s. All the info you need is at 80s Video Shop on social media and we have a special Halloween horror day coming up on Sunday the 16th of October with guest Graham Humphreys who was behind classic VHS and movie art such as A Nightmare on Elm Street 1 and 2, The Evil Dead and Return of the Living Dead to name just a few so please Please come along for an early Halloween treat and meet the man himself. That's all for today's show. Lots of great chats already planned for the coming week, so stay in touch and be sure to share or spread the word wherever you can. And I look forward to speaking to you all again soon. <laughs>